What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here, back again with the Odd Shopper channel. Today, we're talking some college basketball. It is March the 7th. Conference tournaments fully underway, some teams closing out their regular seasons. We'll talk about it all, but before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We're also brought to you by BetMGM, and they have a limited time offer for those of you in legal states, with the exception of New York, Puerto Rico, and Nevada. What you'll do is click the link in the video description below, make your first deposit of at least $5, turn that around $5 wager on any team, total market, whatever you want, you are getting $150 in the form of bonus bets, whether that initial wager wins or loses. And if you're in North Carolina, that is going to go all the way up to $200. You can use this, add it to your bankroll, use it on conference tournaments, use it on March Madness, whatever you like. And it's nice to have that flexibility this time of year with so much going on in the sports world, NBA, NHL, all of it going on right now. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. You must be 21 or older to play in most areas. All right, circling back to yesterday's action, fun slate of games with some up and down record stuff. Basically, every time we take a total now, even with closing line value, we are running into some negative outcomes. So the, the totals that we'll talk about today, I'm going to just throw those at the end, not put them on full screen, because I do realize those have been running extremely bad. As far as some of the other action goes, had some other closing line stuff that just went about as poorly as possible. Nova, you know, we get this at plus one, plus two in some spots, depending on the number you grabbed. I grabbed a plus two early in the day. They finish as a favorite before it tips off. Outright loss to Seton Hall, just a horrific look for Villanova, who's likely on the outside looking in unless they get some sort of run in the Big East tournament and win this week, and they got a tough game on deck on Saturday. But it looks like Nova's going to be an NIT team. LSU, they drop to Arkansas, who is in shambles, so not a good look for them. Mississippi State also falls to a &M. Not a great look for a team that has sort of had this moniker where they can't play on the road to lose another road game. But otherwise, the greasy section did pretty well for us. Lemoyne, Tennessee State, Butler got it done against Xavier. So another one where we push a lot of money around, but we head to today's games. Some of the other big action, you know, Marquette looks pretty good against UConn for most of the game without Tyler Kolek. They're just a tough team to trust in these tough matchups. you got a big in Oso Igdaro who can't shoot. So Klingon wasn't forced to play out on the perimeter whatsoever. Just going to be tough for teams to beat UConn and Purdue. Really across the board is, I think, the major takeaway from the premier games that we saw play out yesterday. As far as today's action goes, it is a Pac-12 dominated slate. We've got one Big Ten game. Wisconsin plays Rutgers. Not too much to see there. Wisconsin has been in free fall, and Rutgers is a team that has struggled to score. So we're mainly going to focus on the greasier section of today's games, if you will, some conference tournaments, some season finales. And then we'll close out with some totals as bonus picks in the end. We'll talk about them. I know some of you want them, but some of you may be a little fearful as I am at this point with some of the totals. But let's dig into the slate. We'll kick things off in the Sun Belt where we have Texas State taking on Southern Miss. This is a game with a pretty close spread overall. Sitting at one and a half, I think this probably moves towards a pick'em or through zero as the slate goes on throughout the day. As far as injury stuff in this game, Texas State enters this game fairly healthy. A few guys ancillary that might miss, but nothing worth noting. There's only one top 40 player on this team to begin with. You can look at this on evanmia.com, sort by conference. It's going to give you a Bayesian performance rating, which is a good way to just measure how these players are performing and how they stack up. You can compare them. So you have one top 40 player on Texas State. You have four top 35 players in Southern Miss. One of them is expected to miss Donovan Ivory. Rumor is he's out for the year. Don't expect concrete news on this. But right now, not expecting Ivory to play. As far as this game goes, Texas State did play in the Sun Belt Tournament already. They beat Old Dominion in an overtime game. And then this will be the debut for Southern Miss, who's been off till this point. And... Winner is going to face Troy, I believe, who had a double buy in this tournament. But as far as stylistics go, we already mentioned just the talent profile for Southern Miss. This is a team that has an overall better roster comparatively. 
They hold some advantages primarily on the offensive end. They're 270th to Texas State's 306th. Texas State just built a little different. This is a team that largely wins through their defense, where they have pretty solid metrics overall, 113th. But this is a team that's sort of bolstered by turnovers. We see this at times. They're 115th in turnovers generated. When you actually dive in and look at what they do on the defensive end, they're 50th at defending the three, but they're 210th at defending the interior. Now, Southern Miss as a team does have a height advantage, 224th. So interesting to see that Texas State still comes out slightly ahead in rebounding. Some of that's just from the offensive side of things. They're 104th in offensive rebounding. We talk about this double-edged sword a lot. Would you rather have a team that just makes their shots initially, or would you rather have a team that needs a couple things to go right, rebounding a missed shot, and then getting a putback that goes in? That's how Texas State plays. They're 329th in effective field goal percentage. Southern Miss is 266th. And Southern Miss, they're not a great offensive team, but they certainly hold vast edges here. Three-point percentage, 168 to 315. On the inside, both teams are pretty bad, but it's 298 to 317. So you actually have pretty decent advantages on the inside. And then as far as defending what this Texas State team does, Southern Miss is 106 at defending the interior. I mean, Southern Texas State isn't good at anything on offense, 317th on the interior, 315th from three. So it's a team that really struggles to score, and then they live on these second chance opportunities. You just have the straight up better scoring team overall in Southern Miss, and you have a team with a better overall talent profile on the roster in Southern Miss. They're coming in as an underdog in this spot. This game is played on a neutral floor, so nothing to worry about home court wise. Pretty surprised to see them as a dog. So that'll be the first play we make with Southern Miss taking on Texas State in the Sun Belt. We are going to keep it fairly greasy throughout the, the whole show today. So we move to Lafayette taking on Lehigh. This is one where you can find Lafayette as a four-point underdog. Expect them to take some money throughout the day. They do hold advantages in this conference and in this matchup. Right now, we're talking Patriot League, so not the best edition of the Patriot League either. This is a home court game, so you have Lafayette actually playing at home, and they do have some advantages particularly on defense. It's slight. They're 181 to 194 over Lehigh. And then on offense, you do have Lehigh with a slight advantage, 290 to 345. But neither team is dealing with many injuries. As far as talent profile goes, it does go Lehigh's way, but it's pretty close. You have four top 20 players. Lafayette has two in the top 20. And then as far as stylistics, what do you really look for in a team that's playing at home with a similar talent profile is do they have advantages? Can they win this game? And how do they stop the opposing team? So Lehigh, they're a team that plays largely through the inside despite not having a tall lineup. 235th in effective height. Terrible matchup for them against Lafayette, who's 78th in effective height. Well, where does Lehigh score? Inside. 164th in two-point percentage versus 298th in three-point percentage. This team cannot shoot, so they try to score near the basket. Well, how is Lafayette composed? We already mentioned they're tall. They're also much better at defending the inside. They're 40th in the country in interior defense, and they're 148th from three, which isn't a terrible mark themselves. So right away, you have the strength of Lafayette's defense matching up against the strength of Lehigh's offense. How do some of these ancillary metrics look? Rebounding, neither team is any good whatsoever, but neither team attacks the glass on offense. I think this is just a product of these teams prioritize defensive rebounding. As far as the turnover battle goes, margin for these two teams is similar. And that's the same for foul margin as well. And then overall scoring, Lafayette, not great. They do hold slight edges, especially from three. They're 292nd in three-point percentage, a slightly ahead, but they shoot a lot of threes. So this is a team that, I mean, they have advantages on defense, which should be what carries this. But then if any of these threes go down, and again, they're 107th in three-point rate, they shoot a lot of them. This should be an advantage for them against Lehigh's 300th ranked three-point defense. They're not also not very good on the inside either, 170th at defending the interior. So it's a lot of points for a home team in Lafayette in a matchup that admittedly is pretty greasy. Neither of these teams has more than 12 wins, but we'll take Lafayette and we'll take the points in this game. Next up, we go to the MAC, the double MAC, M-A-A-C. Iona taking on Manhattan. 
As you can probably gather from just the overall win-loss record on the screen, Manhattan, the Jaspers, have been an absolute disaster this year. They have six wins. They're outside the top 330 in the three key metrics we look at, offensive, defensive efficiency, and rebounding. Iona is hovering around the top 200 in at least two of those, 203 in offense, 202 in defense. And the talent profile is just vastly different for these two teams. You have six players in the top 30 for Iona. One of them is injured. That's Greg Gordon. Not sure if he plays. He's the 30th ranked player in this conference. But Manhattan doesn't even have a single top 70 player. 7-0, Manhattan doesn't have a single player in the top 70 of this entire conference. Just horrifyingly bad statistics for Manhattan. They don't play with a tall lineup. They're 288th. Neither does Iona, 257th. But I mean, when you look at talent profiles, that could potentially beat Iona or cover a seven-point spread. Manhattan doesn't have that. Very rarely do you see teams with rebounding advantages, or very rarely do you see with Iona having rebounding advantages over teams. They're 311th. They have one in this spot. Manhattan's 331st. Both teams shoot a lot of threes. One of them's good at that. Iona, 90th in three-point percentage. Manhattan, 317th. Not to mention the strength of Iona's defense is defending opposing guards. Again, they're not tall, so they do struggle inside. But Manhattan's 307th in interior scoring. Pace is pretty good in this game. So when you look at the value of a point covering a spread this large, 172nd is Iona's pace, 106th is Manhattan's. Iona should be able to get this done and cover this spread. As far as just game environment stuff, this will be a, a road game for Iona in this conference, which gives me some pause. They're closing their season out, but ultimately... They're just the vastly superior team over Manhattan. So we will take the spread and lay the points here, despite them playing on the road. Next up, we head to the Horizon. Milwaukee takes on Green Bay. This is a rematch that actually was just played over the weekend, but it's a little bit different. This is the Horizon League tournament, the second round. Milwaukee just played on Tuesday against Detroit Mercy, who had one win, and it was a pretty greasy game. He had a four-point victory for Milwaukee. Certainly didn't cover that spread. But this is one where you can find Green Bay as a pick em. This is exceedingly important because it's going to move through zero. I can guarantee you that. We'll talk about why in a second. But speaking to getting the best line, Odd Chopper is the place you want to be. You can click the link below. What it's going to do is allow you to customize based on your state, based on the books you use, whatever you want, highly customizable. Find you the best line, which makes a huge difference in your bottom line. And there's all sorts of tools involved in this. We have a market-based approach you can use to find plus EV betting spots, college basketball, player props, NBA, NHL, whatever you play, whatever, we have it all. And the Discord's now included. I use this, our other experts use this. We take all of these picks, all these tools, drop the analysis in the Discord and try to make it easy for you. It's all included in one price. A week is $14.95, a month is $49.95. No long-term commitments. Extremely useful this time of year when there's a lot going on. And I think you'll find it useful too. All right, as far as this game goes, and why it's going to move. Noah Reynolds is back for Green Bay. He's the best player for this team. He's the leading scorer, and he's the fourth most valuable player in the entire conference. The entire conference. Efficiency metrics basically work Milwaukee's way only on offense, and I even question this at times, because Green Bay is the better shooting team. So yeah, you have Milwaukee 171, Green Bay 234 on offense, but effective field goal, Milwaukee's 166th, Green Bay is 87th. Three-point attempts per game, Milwaukee's 99th, Green Bay is 9th, and Green Bay is much better at shooting threes. They're almost 50 spots ahead in just raw three-point percentage. They also defend the three much better, 15th versus 217. So you have two teams that shoot a ton of threes. One of them can't defend the three. One of them is awesome at defending it. And that same team, Green Bay, is better at shooting them altogether. Neither team is particularly tall. And we've seen Milwaukee victimized by rebounding quite a bit. This team has some of the weirdest rebounding metrics in the country. 111th in total rebounding, 16th on offense, but 342nd on defense. So they give up a ton of second chance opportunities too. And sometimes they do this to teams that don't even attack the glass. And then from there, they're just horrific on defense really across the board. They generate no turnovers. That's been a way teams can beat Green Bay because they do turn it over a lot. Both teams actually really struggle with this. But I think we see a cleaner game overall because neither defense generates a lot of turnovers. And then just interior scoring, Green Bay 66th, Milwaukee 121st. Getting your best score back should be huge for this game environment. We'll back Green Bay as a pick em. I even think this is okay through one. 
Last game we'll talk about in depth. Head not west, Cal State, Fullerton takes on Cal State. Riverside, this is one where I think we're getting some value with the underdog. This conference is still closing out conference play, so not in the tournament just yet. But Fullerton's plus four and a half. This should immediately pique your interest. Even when you just look at the players for this team, and I, there are some injuries. Max Jones for Fullerton hasn't played in a while. He's the 41st ranked player in this conference. But Riverside's been without Isaiah Moses, who's 44th. Moses is their best player at 44th. Fullerton has three players in the top 36. Riverside is zero. So you do have a talent gap between these two teams. And we're talking about two bad teams. So the talent profiles are interesting. The offensive edge goes to Riverside. The defensive edge goes to Fullerton. As far as rebounding goes, I'm not sure either team's going to have drastic advantages. Riverside is taller. That is without a doubt. But they do also kind of live on the offensive glass at times. That's the one thing I'm scared of backing Fullerton here is just the size of Riverside on the other side. When you look at this team in Riverside, they're horrific at scoring from the inside, and they don't even try to at times. 348th in interior scoring. They haven't been effective using this advantage, the height advantage, and instead they've opted to shoot a ton of threes, 65th in three-point rate, but 288th in three-point percentage. Meanwhile, Fullerton is 64th in three-point defense. They will struggle more inside to defend opposing teams' big men. But again, Riverside hasn't had success using their interior to score. And just raw effective field goal percentage, Fullerton's 291, Riverside is 338. Very, very bad metrics there. You do have a Fullerton team that forces a ton of turnovers. They're 98. They also generate a lot of fouls, 54th there. Riverside's 247th in fouls committed. A lot of micro edges that point Fullerton's direction, and this is another one I expect to move through four and a half. All right, let's talk these bonus picks. There's a couple. Didn't throw them on the screen because I'm as weary of these totals as you are, but I expect them both to move, and there's two overs I'm interested in. Canisius taking on Fairfield. The number's 145 and a half. Expect that to go through 146. Take it if you're not a little nervous about totals like I am. And then Grambling, Alabama A&M over 131. This is certainly going to rise. Whether it comes in is a different story. Last thing, I'm probably going to take Nichols over southeastern Louisiana plus four to round this out. That'll do it for us today. We'll be back on Friday talking more games. Not sure what the slate's going to look like because we're in tournaments. Saturday is another mega slate. We'll have content for that as well. And then we'll be full speed ahead for conference tournaments and March Madness. If you have a question, reach out to me on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. Comments, please leave them below. It helps us a ton. Until next time, good luck, everyone. We will see you later.